Hi everyone. So welcome to the stream today. Very much excited for having you. Uh, I see some of you already giving us a thumbs up on the video. Thank you very much. If you joined the stream, I want you to do among other things, two things for me. Number one, hit the like button on the video. Make it blue. If it is not blue, click on it. It will be blue. That way we get more engagement on the video. And that is what YouTube wants so that when a video can be pushed by YouTube so we can reach as many students as possible. And then also let me know in the chat box where you are watching from, what questions you have for me. I see some comments already coming in in the chat. I'm going to be uh, reading all of your comments for you. Any questions that you have, put it in the chat box. Today we're looking at the accounting standard lectures. I'm going to take you through the overview of all the accounting standards, how they are linked together. Then we'll pick a number of accounting standards and then start with them. Definitely we're going to be starting with IAS 16 and then uh, dive deeper into other standards. I'm also going to be solving questions from the ICA question kit, both for corporate reporting and then uh, financial reporting. So remember I've told you to get this book over and over again. Almost all the questions, you'll be trying as much as possible to solve the questions from the question banks or the question kit. So I encourage you to make sure you get a question kit. If you don't have one, as this season, I'm going to be focusing on the question bank or the question kit plus other sources or other questions coming in in that order. So I see some comments coming in there. So you make sure that probably from tomorrow you can get access to this question kit. If you are doing corporate reporting, get a corporate report. If you are doing financial reporting, get a financial reporting. For my accounting students also, get uh, management accounting. Public sector students, get public sector accounting. Because uh, anything that we're going to be doing and questions we're going to be solving will be coming from the question uh, bank of the ICA and we want to find out there are great questions here and how the questions are structured and I'm also going to be bringing some questions from other sources as well coming in from my uh, books and from my content as well to assist you in order for you to prepare well for the examination. So thank you very much for the thumbs up. I see some of you guys joining. Give me a thumbs up on the video and also share the video if you know you have a colleague that is preparing for the ICA examination or an ACCA exams and needs this study or this lecture on accounting standard, do well to share the video with them so that we can uh, reach as many students as possible. So I see some comments flowing in. Let me uh, look at the comments real quick, then we get to the day's uh, business. All right, so uh, Oluchi Inonwa, now forgive me if I don't mention your name right, okay? So I'll stick with Oluchi. Good evening, Oluchi. I hope you're doing well. And then Oluchi said, please, what standards are we looking at today? Yeah, I'm going to give you an overview of all the standards, the breakdown of all of the standards. Then we'll start with IAS 16. So today we're going to be diving deeper into IAS 16 and then uh, uh, some other non-current asset related standards as far as we can cover up to the time that uh, we will be over. Um, Oluchi said, and can there be a session where you answer past questions on ACCA FR section A and B, where they ask questions on standard and others? Thank you. Yeah, definitely that could be done. So Oluchi, let me add that to my uh, question kit. I see some of you joining the stream. Welcome to the lecture. Very much excited for having you. Give me a thumbs up on the page, on the video. Make it blue. If it is not blue, hit on it. It will be blue. And that way we get more engagement on the video and we'll be able to reach as many students as possible. But most importantly, I want to also hear from you in the chat box, in the comment box, what topics would you want me to cover? Uh, don't give me subjects, okay? So give me topics you want me to cover in various subjects in the chat box. That way I'm going to, I'm able to capture it. My team will look at it and then we'll create content, create, get questions on it. So we'll be covering it on the live stream as well. So let me add Oluchi's uh, concern or questions to my uh, dial here so I could capture that out. So questions and answers on F7, session A and B. Even though that's going to be purely objective session area, it's going to be valuable to everyone, section A and B. So Oluchi, keep following and uh, content will be made available for you in that regard. Charles Zuli, I see you with a uh, emoji hand in the chat box, welcome. Gabriel Koku, uh, Goku, 
Sir, would you continue the financial accounting playlist? Okay, Gabriel. Uh, the issue is that um, if there are any videos that are currently not up on our channel, what happens is that um, because there are a lot of content we are releasing, if you really want to get access to all of the videos at once, then probably you would have to enroll uh, and, and study online uh, with me or enroll in our courses online and get access to the full course, okay? Because probably we'll not be able to cover as much as we are supposed to cover. So, Gabriel, maybe you can consider enrolling in the full course online with us and you can reach us on 050 114-9296, and then we can uh, deal with that in that case. Samuel Quaisin, I see you. You are welcome to the stream. Gabriel said, pictures are clear. Very important. Thank you very much. Andrea Pombeko, you are welcome. Um, Charles Zuli, watching from WA. All right, WA. Gabriel Kwaku said, when will November ICA exams registration start? Um, exams registration could start probably next month, something like that. Uh, as results are going to be released any moment from this week or early next week, or maybe by Friday the exams, the results will be out. So maybe registration will start from next month. But the most important thing is not the exams registration. The most important thing is your studies and your readiness for the exam. All right? Kletos, good evening, sir. Been a while. I will try and see you soon. Hope you are doing well. Yeah, Kletos, I'm doing well, and I hope you are also doing well. Prince Afeto, I see you. Charles Zuli, good evening, sir. Two days. Joseph Pashi, I see you, Joseph. Uh, Joshua Boachi, yeah, no, please. I would like you to cover the IPSAS in uh, public sector accounting. All right, so these are some of the things I'm looking for. The IPSAS in public sector accounting and finance. That's awesome. Now, Joseph, let me say that you can check the playlist on the channel. We already have some of the IPSAS on the channel. So you can start watching those IPSAS as we gear towards uh, going through the others. But like I said earlier, if really you want content on some things fully, then probably you can consider to enroll on the course online. That way you get access to the full content because for public sector accounting and finance on our online portal, we cover the, ver the various IPSAS and the various contents that you need in order for you to pass the exam. So probably you may want to consider that as well. If it is something you want to look out for, you can reach out 050-114-9296, 050-114-9296, anytime and then an enrollment can be done. But you can start watching what is on the channel already. And then as we go on, the ones that will be able to be added before the exams, then you'll be able to get access to that as well. Um, Samad, hello. Looking good in this shirt all right thank you so much uh mohammed sakib hi there bernard Della, hi there and as donko thank you for the lectures and advice you've been sharing it's always a pleasure ns thank you also for appreciating that come on give me a thumbs up on the video man uh we have a lot of people on the live stream give me a thumbs up on the video thank you very much i see some of you with a thumbs up on the video Thank you very, very much. Really appreciate it. It helps us, the channel, to grow. It helps us to reach as many students as possible so that we can uh, really affect a lot of people and assist a lot of people across the country, across the continent. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I'm seeing the thumbs up on the video. Right, so if you have any questions, please put it in the chat box. I'm going to be going through all of your comments and reading them as well. Then most importantly, let me know in the chat box what topics you want me to cover. Don't give me subjects, all right? Give me topics. What topics you want me to cover in what subject you're doing so that I can create content, I can prepare content in that regard so I could assist you better to pass your examination. Remember, my objective on this live stream is to assist you with your areas of difficulty, all right? So that I, I bring in content, I answer questions, I provide you with assistance you need so you pass the exam. That is my objective. So assist me so we can together do this. Um, Joshua Yadam said, please do cover relevant costing in my accounting as well. Thank you. Okay, relevant costing. Uh, Joshua, we have a content on relevant costing on the channel already. So you can check that out in the meantime as we prepare uh, for another content on that. Okay, so you can check the management accounting playlist on the channel and you will see a content on relevant costing. I think there are about two or three videos on the channel on relevant costing in the management accounting, and you will be able to 
get that as well. Then uh, Oluchi said leases, taxes, and earnings per share. So if I get you right, Oluchi, uh, you mean IFRS 16, IAS 12, IFRS 16, IAS 12. These are the kind of things I'm looking for so that we can plan content around these topics. IFRS 16, I, uh, IAS 12, and then IAS 33 earnings per share. Okay. So, Oluchi, um, you can check the channel page. We already have some content as well on these things that you've raised. So, you can start watching those contents on the channel as we prepare for other new content and then solve some practical questions from the ICAR question case as well in that case. So, you can start checking the Accounting Standard uh, Series playlist. I think we have about 52 or 53 videos as of today in that channel and it can assist you to prepare well for the exams. Then let's see some comments coming in here. Oluchi Jacob, thank you for adding my previous suggestion. All right, Oluchi. Uh, Rotimi Fred said, I would like you to cover the foundations of hedge accounting. Okay, so hedge accounting. A lot of the topics that I'm having today, hedge accounting, because this will help us to create content and uh, prepare for more specific content in that case. Felix Ado Akwete, I see your, I saw your message, but I think you deleted it so you can re-ask it the way you want it to be asked, so I can answer your questions for you, Berta. All right. Now, when it comes to the accounting standards, if you are doing corporate reporting or financial reporting, these are very critical areas, very crucial areas that you don't want to compromise on. Why is this important? Because in as much as you're going to be getting a dedicated 20 mark question on the accounting standards to succeed in the preparation and presentation of financial statements. That is the statement of profit or loss and other comprehensive income, the statement of changes in equity, the statement of financial position, and then the cash flow statement. To, for you to succeed in the preparation of this single entity financial statement, you need to be strong in the accounting standard. If not, then you're going to be really having problems in uh, the preparation of the financial statement. So we want to look at the overview, the connections, and how the various accounting standards relates to each other or connects to each other. And then we will start today's journey or today's broadcast, especially with IAS 16 and then other related standards connected to IAS 16. And this is a master class, okay? So I'm going to be running this from now till the end of the year as you prepare to write your exam. So and but remember that we're going to be mixing it up with other subjects, with other topics, from other subjects as well as we proceed so that we can have a balance of sessions as well. Then I will also be having some uh, uh, free Skype. Right, so you want to stay active so that when those uh, meetings are available, you will be able to join them. So let's go into the accounting standard. I think I see a comment also coming in. Let me touch on that, then we get into the discussion. Please, can you do something about your timing? As most of us are still at work, at still are uh, still working, say 5.30 p.m. <laughs> All right, um, Felix Addo, uh, 5.30 p.m., we could look at that, but then the thing also is that uh, even if you miss the live stream, you can watch the playback always, all right? Because 5.30 wouldn't be uh, accurate for us here because of the fact that I have lectures at 6 p.m., Right, so I need to, or at most 6 30, 6 20, 6 30, I need to start my class uh, for the evening sessions. For that reason, 
That is why we do the 4.30. Because if we uh, take it to 5.30, it means we will not have enough time in that case. So, Felix, all I will say is that if you, are, if, you are, if you miss the broadcast, it's not a big deal. You can just you can watch the playback all the time. And if you have any questions about it, you put it in the comment box. I will come in there and then assist you with any questions that you have. Uh, Josie Machado, uh, part versus normative theory, auditing, auditing, substantive testing, hedge accounting. Whoa, whoa, I like these questions coming in there. Um, so let me take a screenshot here. Okay, so uh, auditing, substantive testing, hedge accounting, ethics, and risk management. Okay, so hedge accounting, someone else mentioned that also. So we're going to be adding that to the slide. Ethics, very critical. We're going to be adding that into that. So Tracy Chamado, I would say that we already have some content on ethics on the channel. So you can start watching that as we prepare to look at another content on ethics and solve some questions as well in that area. Ratimi said, I think this is the best medium among your media to have your attention. For this reason, I will endeavor to join the classes even as I would love to progress with you. However, I want to personal tutorial. Yeah, you can reach us if you want any personal tutorial or whatever it is. 0501149296. If you want private tuition or whatever it is. 0501149296. That is plus 233 if you are outside Ghana. Plus 233 if you are outside Ghana. If you want any inquiry or whatever it is, you can reach us on that number in that case. So enough of it. Let's get into the, the discussion today. So like I mentioned, accounting standards are very critical. So what I want to do first is to give you a breakdown of the accounting standard. Then today we're going to be starting with IAS 16. And then like I said, make sure you get this book. I don't know if it is 40 cities or whatever it is, 50 cities or whatever it is. Get a question bound, okay? Because the questions I'll be solving on this live stream in all the subjects, financial reporting, public sector, um, management accounting, audit and assurance, corporate reporting will be coming from here. Will be coming from the question banks. So I will entreat you to have the question banks as it will help you to be able to prepare well for the exams. So when it comes to the accounting standards, there are some accounting standards that we need to look out for. I call them the basic, basic accounting standards. But before then, we need to start with usually dealing with the elements in the financial statement. Now, you know the elements in the financial statement, assets, liability, uh, expenses, income, revenue, and then what? Equity. So as always, we would want to start with the assets accounting standards. That is accounting standards covering the assets. So when it comes to dealing with the assets, that is the non-current assets, the non-current assets, a number of standards are going to be coming to play that we need to look at, that we need to uh, focus on. The first one here, as always, is IAS 16, property plant and equipment, then IAS 20, government grants, IAS 23, borrowing cost, IAS 40, investment property, IFRS 5, asset held for sale and discontinued operation. So these are the starting accounting standards that we need to understand. But as you are learning non-current asset standards, you see, the standards are not just on their own. The standards are not just on isolation. Some standards are intertwined. You may get a question where you are applying IAS 16, where you are applying IAS 12, and where you are applying IFRS uh, 16. So when you are learning the non-current asset accounting standards, there are some further standards that are connected to these standards that you must take note of. Like IAS 12, income tax. All right? IAS 36, impairment of assets. IAS 37, provisions, contingent liability, contingent assets, provisions, contingent liability, contingent assets, then IAS 38, intangible assets. All right, these 
are connected when dealing with what? The non-current asset. Because they have relationship with a non-current asset and you must look at them not in isolation, but you, you must look at them how they relate to the non-current asset accounting standards. So these are other four that are very critical that we need to look out for. Then aside these, there are some classes of accounting standards that also have close relationship when dealing with the assets of the organization, and that is IFRS 16. That is the new accounting standard on lease. I did a two-part video on leases on the channel, and if you have not watched it, make sure you watch that video, the two-part video I did on IFRS 16 leases, and you can get a breakdown of the understanding and what it is that you need to look out for. So leases, I'm going to be covering that. Then IFRS 15, revenue from contracts with customers. Then we need to talk about financial instruments. IFRS 9, financial instrument, one fundamental accounting standard that we need to look out for in there. Now, aside these standards, there are some other minor standards that we need to look out for. Now, I'm using the word minor in a generic way. Now, that doesn't mean they aren't important, but I'm calling them minor as they play some uh, minor, minor supporting roles in other standards. Things such as this, events after the reporting period, IS 10, then IS 8, very, very critical accounting standards, accounting policy, accounting estimates, and change in accounting policy. IS 8, a very key accounting standard. standard. IS 2, inventory. Very fundamental, very critical, we need to look out for in that case. So what are we saying? The first compartment has to do with these five guys. The second compartment has to do with these four guys here. The third compartment has to do with these three guys here. Then we come to this aspect of the syllabus. Now, there are other standards that I could link up here, and that is IAS 20, uh, 33, earnings per share. IAS 23 earnings per share. Very critical accounting standard. We're going to be looking at it later on as we build up uh, our journey on understanding this uh, area. Now, aside looking at these standards, there are some other standards. If you are doing corporate reporting, then there are some other standards we need to highlight on, like IAS 19 employment benefits. Note that uh, if you are doing financial reporting, the examiner also requires that you understand IAS 19, Employment Benefit, then IFRS 2, uh, Share-Based Payment, IAS 24, Related Party Transaction. All of those standards are critical. Then I think IFRS, we, there are some standards that are related to consolidated financial statement. I'm not listing them as part of these standards here, like IFRS uh, 2, uh, IFRS 10, okay, IAS 3, IFRS sorry, IF, IFRS 3 business combination, IS 28 investment in associate. These kind of standards or these standards are consolidated financial statement standards. And so we will discuss those things when we are talking about consolidated financial statements later on in our discussion during this, this season. So we're going to be starting the idea by looking at these standards. Now, what does that mean? Before you get to the exam hall, listen to this carefully. Before you get to the exam hall, whether you are doing financial reporting or corporate reporting, before you get to the exam hall, you have to make sure that at least, at least, the following standards, you know them of here. Number one, IAS 16. Number two, IAS 12. Number three, IAS 36, 37, 38, IAS 8. Leases, financial instruments, and this guy. So look at the standards that I've marked out. Whether you like it or not, what it means is that when you are asleep and I come and wake you up, and I say, hey, wake up, Derek, or wake up, Charles, tell me about IAS 12, you should be able to say, no, you see, this is one thing you've got to understand. The examiner can bring standard questions, but it to be a theory question. Meaning that there are no figures there for you to calculate anything. The examiner wants you to write stories <laughs> for him. So when you are learning the standard, please take note about not your ability to just solve questions, not your ability to just do the computation, 
but have a comprehensive understanding to be able to narrate what you are calculating. Because, for instance, when it comes to dealing with income tax, the examiner can ask you how you should, uh, how an entity should treat a certain transaction, and there are no figures there. Then you need to find out how do we calculate the carrying value, how do we calculate the tax base, how do we determine the temporary difference, how do we even determine whether it's a deferred tax asset, deferred tax liability, and how do we subsequently account for that? Nine out of ten, when the figures are provided, students are able to do the computations. But when there are no figures and students are supposed to do written aspects of the standards, it becomes problematic. So I will entreat you, I will encourage you that as you are learning these standards, don't just learn them in the context of your ability to solve all questions in the world, but your ability to have a comprehensive understanding. That means you can't chew baba on these standards. It won't work. Don't chew baba on this standard. Have a comprehensive understanding of them. Know what they do. Know how they apply in practical life, in real life. And then have a grasp of it. And then just be able to know it's offered because that will help you to have a deeper understanding. Because one of the secrets is this. When learning accounting standards, this is one of the secrets. When learning accounting standards, uh, you can solve numerous questions. And I will still give you a question and you will not be able to solve. It is not just about your ability to solve questions, but it's about understanding the concepts. Very, very important. So please, make sure that no matter what you do, irrespective of how you're doing, I want you to make sure that you are okay with IAS 16. Everything about IAS 16, all the integrities of IAS 16, you know it, you understand it, and you know how all of the treatments are done very well. Then you make sure IAS 8, it is very, very important. Accounting policy, changes in accounting estimates and errors. How do we do a change in accounting policy? What are they? How do we do the treatment? A change in accounting estimates. What are they? How do we do the treatment? Under what circumstances can an entity change an accounting policy? You must understand all of these principles. And then when there is a scenario up and there is an error, there is a change in accounting policy, how do you do the accounting? Do you do risk, uh, prospective application or uh, uh, retrospective uh, appli application? So how do you do all of these things? You must understand that. Then one of the crop accounting standards that whether you like it or not, it is going to be in each examination setting, apart from IAS 16, is IAS 12. It is going to be there. Whether you are preparing the income statement or the statement of financial position or the cash flow statement, something about IAS 12 is going to be there. Tax is going to be there. So if I were you, it will be one of the standards that I will make sure I understand very well, I understand very, very, very well. I cannot overemphasize the importance of you understanding uh, income tax. And sometimes students say it's a difficult standard, but this, this is my personal view. None of these standards are difficult. That each of the standards have their own uh, uh, technique or principle that if you fail to understand, irrespective of the questions you solve, you will still not be able to understand it. So like I said in the beginning, Make sure you understand the principles, you understand the concepts, you understand the basics, you understand the underlying factors of all of these standards so you can be able to take your life, take your understanding to the next level. Because sometimes I see people solving a lot of questions, but they still have problems with the standard. So it is not just about the number of questions you solve, but it's about understanding the principles and how the principles apply under various circumstances. Then, Impairment of assets. Very, very important. Now, close to impairment of assets, if you are a follower of my work and you watch any of my videos on impairment before, you realize that I don't do impairment alone because it goes with the junior brother, intangible assets. So, as you are doing intangible assets, impairment will bring itself in. So, impairment and intangible assets, very critical, very, very important. Then, IS27. Uh, 37, provisions, contingent liability, contingent assets. You've got to make sure that you master that standard, you understand it very well as a student as you go into the exam. Then, these two bad boys, IFRS 16 leases, and then IFRS 15, revenue from contract with customers and the various principles that underline the accounting treatment of each of these things. Please make sure you spend some time to look at it. We will be covering as much as we can cover on the channel here on YouTube, 
But you've got to go beyond what is on the channel here on YouTube to be able to really get a full understanding of all of the standards that you need and practice the questions you need to practice in order for you to really understand what you were looking at. And then financial instrument. This has become a, a, a core accounting standard, especially for those doing financial uh, corporate reporting. Almost every standard, there is something about financial instrument because it is something that is fundamental, something that is critical when it comes to the preparation of financial statement. So these are accounting standards that you must understand. But you see, the, the truth of the matter is that even though I have marked out one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, that I want you to understand, oh, 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 no matter who you are, wherever you are, you must make sure you understand these standards. These standards don't go alone. And no, Tina, if you are learning IAS 16, you must make sure you understand how to deal with government grants because it is connected. You must know how to treat with borrowing costs because it is connected. You must know how to look at investment properties because it is connected. You must know how to deal with IFRS 5, asset held for sale and discontinued operation because it is what? Connected. So these are the things that you need to understand about the overview of the accounting standards. I see some of you guys joining the stream. Welcome to the stream. Give me a thumbs up on the video if you join. Let the like button be blue. Click on it to be blue. That way we get more engagement on the video. And YouTube, that's what YouTube wants. You'll be able to promote the video so we can reach as many students as possible and be able to uh, actually assist a lot of students across the continent, across the country, so that we can together uh, become successful and make the world a better place. So give me a thumbs up on the video. Thank you very much. I see some of you with a thumbs up. Then I see some comments again coming in. Let me look at that and then let's go through the standards. Josie Chamado said, I just watched your IFRS 9 list. Was great. Thank you. But happy for more. All right. We'll be covering more of them in that case. Uh, Rotimi Fred said, Can I get a copy of the book outside Ghana, say UK? Yes, I think you should uh, be able to. Uh, you can reach out to the Institute of Chartered Accountants Ghana. When you call them, this book is done by Emil Wolf. So they are. Uh, in the European Union, UK, I guess. So they'll be able to arrange delivery for you uh, from there. So you can reach out to them. Derek Asiama, please, can you do a video on IAS 2 and International Accounting Standard IAS 8? Yeah, definitely. I've listed it here. So definitely we're going to be covering it in the discussion, Derek. So you stay connected. If you have not subscribed to the channel, make sure you subscribe to the channel and stay connected. We're going to cover in that. Gabriel Gogu said, like the video, please. Okay, Gabriel. Gabriel is telling you guys to like the video because that helps us to grow the channel. All right. So now I'm going to snap this. For those of you who are not able to, for some reason, write all of them before I clean, I'm going to snap it and post it on my Instagram page. So you can follow me on Instagram, Mr. Premium. And I'm going to post it on my Instagram page and uh, you'll be able to get access to that as well. So now that we have understood the overview of the standards, the standards we need to focus on and all that we need to look out for, thank you very much, guys. I really appreciate it. Thank you for the thumbs up on the video. Thank you very much. Really, really appreciate it. I see a comment coming in from uh, Nanyang Gudba. Sorry if I don't mention your name right, okay? Forgive me. Um, no, my fault, like that. Uh, Nanya Gupta said, video on interpretation of consolidated financial statement. Video on it. Okay. So interpretation of consolidated financial statement. Okay. Going to be adding that to the list I have here. Interpretation of financial statements. All right. Good. So added. We're going to be looking at that as we proceed. All right. Okay. So now that we have this. Let's begin the journey today and start with IAS 16, property, plant, and equipment. And then let's look at how the breakdown of this standard actually work. Now, this is one thing I want you to understand. There are some of you, uh, maybe you are doing corporate reporting or you have a previous knowledge of the standards. This is what I want you to do. Don't just say, oh, 
I know this standard already, so I will learn it. Or I know this standard already, so there is no need to go through it. I can guarantee you that if you have that mindset or if you have that way of looking at a thing, you will not be able to really appreciate or understand it very well. So whatever it is that uh, probably we've covered already or you really watch a video already, I would want you to still go through it as a child, as, as a juvenile, as somebody who doesn't know anything about it. And when you open your mind like that, you can get new nuggets to be able to help you to really understand the standards, all right? So I know that some of you might have understood some of the standards or know them already as we'll be going through them, but come with an open mind and I will guarantee, I can guarantee you, as we go through the principles and solve some questions, you will realize that, yes, even though you knew something, it wasn't as much as you thought you knew so that it can prepare well for the examination. Hakim, Kana, I see you. Good day, boss. Hope we have started new season. Yes, we have started new season. So that is what we are on today. All right, so let's go through and start with IAS 16, property plans and equipment. Now, generally, we say that uh, current assets are resources that are uh, controlled by an entity as a result of past events uh, from which future economic benefit flows to the entity. Now, there are various classes of assets or classification of assets. We have non-current assets, current assets, we have tangible assets, intangible assets, and all of those things, and we'll get into some of these things later on as we proceed, as we continue with our understanding. But we want to start a journey and look at a couple of things. Whoa. Let's get this boy powered up. Okay. So there are a couple of standards that we're going to be looking at in relation to how we account for various assets. But our focus here is to deal with non-current assets. Now, when it comes to accounting for non-current assets in general, there are two things that you must understand. We have what is called owner-occupied non-current assets and then non-owner-occupied non-current assets. Now, please follow me carefully here because this is going to build up the foundation for the knowledge that we're going to be uh, looking at later on as we proceed with our discussion. So, owner-occupied non-current assets and then non-owner-occupied non-current assets. Now, owner-occupied non-current assets are simply the non-current assets that a business controls and it's used in the day-to-day -day running of the organization. So either the entity is using the asset as its head office, it is using the asset as a delivery uh, uh, van, or it is using the asset as something. So the asset is used in the day-to-day -day running of the organization. If the assets are used by the entity in the day-to-day -day running of the organization and the entity controls that asset, then that asset has to be accounted for in accordance with IAS 16, property plans and equipment. So assets that an entity controls and the entity is using the assets for its day-to-day -day transactions or its day-to-day -day running, those assets are referred to as what? Owner-occupied assets. And we account for those assets, we account for those non-current assets in accordance with IAS 16. But there are certain non-current assets which entities control as a result of past events but the entity doesn't use it in its day-to-day -day running. In other words, they control the asset, but it is not part of the day-to-day -day running of the business. It is not part of what uh, is included in the day-to-day -day assets of the organization. Those assets may be held for either rental purposes, okay, rental purposes, or will be held for capital appreciation. Now, please note, when we say those assets can be held for rental purposes, we mean finance, sorry, we mean operating lease. Listen to this carefully, because if the entity controls the asset, but the entity leases the asset under a finance lease, then the entity loses control of the asset. So in that case, the asset will be accounted for in accordance with 
IFRS 16, lessor accounting. However, if the entity controls the asset and the entity is leasing the asset under an operating lease, then we say it is what? A non-owner occupied asset. So when we say rental purposes here, we are talking about operating lease and not finance lease. And I want you to make sure you get that understanding very well. Then sometimes an entity can be holding an asset or controlling an asset and they are not using it for day-to-day -day running. Neither are they renting it out for someone to occupy it in the meantime, but they are just holding on the asset so that the value of the asset will rise so they can probably sell it out. Those assets are held for what we call capital appreciation. What we need to understand is that assets that an entity controls which are held for rental purposes or for capital appreciation purposes are accounted for in accordance with IAS 40 investment property. Okay, investment property, IAS 40, investment property. So you remember in the intro, I told you that um, when you are learning IAS 16, you need to understand IAS 40 because this is the bridge. Sometimes entities can be using an asset for their day-to-day -day running. Then something will happen, then they will now come and use the asset for rental purposes or they will stop using the asset for the day-to-day -day running of the organization, but we want to use it or hold on it so that when the value of the asset rises, they can sell the asset. So if we have those kind of scenarios, if we have those kind of circumstances there, that means that we are moving from an asset that we were accounting for as owner-occupied under IAS 16 to an asset that we will now be accounting for under non-owner-occupied IAS 40. So you must understand the bridge of how entities can move from IAS 40, sorry, IAS 16 to IAS 40. Now the reverse is true. An entity can be having an asset and it is currently not using the asset. So maybe start letting the asset to, for, for other or to other entities to use. But at a point, the business has grown and they are looking for, uh, they are looking to expand. So they will stop now renting the assets and now want to use the assets in the day-to-day -day running of the organization. Under such scenarios, it means that we are moving from a non-owner occupied IAS 40 accounting to an owner occupied IAS 16 accounting. And it is very important for you to understand how these movements are done and how any fair value gain or loss are accounted for in the financial statement. But for now, we will not get into the details of all of those things. Uh, we will get into these things later on after we talk about IAS 16 and we are talking about IAS 40. Then we can br bring that bridge of the gap. Then you can know the movement and the various accounting treatments that you need to understand. So in a nutshell, when we talk about non-current assets, it can be either an owner-occupied or a non-owner-occupied. Our focus in today's discussion right now is to start with the owner-occupied and to talk about IAS 16, property, plans, and equipment. Now, the objective of this standard, like I mentioned a moment ago, simply is to prescribe the accounting treatment of non-current, not a uh, Owner occupied non current assets. Let me take that again. The objective of this standard is to prescribe the accounting treatment for non uh, owner occupied non current assets. Okay, owner occupied non current assets. So, what do we mean here? For whatever standards you take, there are three or four things that you need to understand. Whatever standard you take, there are about four things you need to understand. Number one, key definitions. Okay, standards have key definitions that we need to know about. So key definition, the first thing. Second thing is to understand the issue about the recognition criteria. Now, certainly note that before you even come to the key definition, you must understand the objective of the standard. Like I told you about IAS 16, the objective of IAS 16 is to prescribe the accounting treatment of owner-occupied non-current assets. That's the objective. But there are key definitions that we'll be talking about and we'll be running through them as and when we build our understanding of this. And then recognition criteria for that particular item in the financial statement. Then subsequent measurement 
on what is called measurement basis. So after the initial recognition, there has to be what? Subsequent measurement. And you have to be able to understand how these things are done. But here we are, we have not finished. There is also what is called disclosure requirement. So this is the thing you need to understand. The examiner can come from anywhere. Listen carefully. As far as we are dealing with standards, the examiner can come from anywhere. He can ask you some key definitions. He can ask you the recognition criteria or how a, an item can be recognized initially in the financial statement. He can ask you on the subsequent measurement of an element or an item or a transaction in the financial statement. Then the sweet spot is that he can also ask you about the disclosure requirement of a certain standard. So whatever standard you pick, you, got, you have to ask yourself, what are the key definitions in this standard that I need to know? You need to ask yourself that question. What are the key definitions in this standard that I need to know? That is the first step. Second step, you need to ask yourself, what, what is the recognition criteria for this transaction, for this standard? Then what is the subsequent requirement or subsequent measurement after the initial recognition? And then the fourth thing is what? The disclosure requirement. So back to IS 16, key definitions, like I mentioned, I'll be giving you the definition of the key items as and when we build our understanding on IAS 16. So let's go into it. So what is the recognition criteria of assets? What is the recognition criteria of assets? Now, so recognition criteria. Let me set some water real quick. All right, so let's go. So what is the recognition criteria of assets? Recognition criteria. The standard states that for a transaction to be recognized as an asset, it has to meet the definition of an asset. <laughs> for a transaction to be recognized as an asset, it must meet the definition of an asset. And what is an asset? An asset is a resources controlled by an entity as a result of past events from which future economic benefit flows to the entity. So for us to recognize a transaction as an asset or recognize an item as an asset in the financial statement, it must meet the definition of an asset. Aside this benchmark rule, there are two key things that we must see before we can recognize an asset under IAS 16. And the first one is that Cost can reliably be measured. So cost can be measured reliably. Cost can be measured reliably. That is the first thing. The cost of the asset can be measured reliably. So we will, we will get into how we determine all that in a moment. But the cost of the asset can be measured reliably. Then the second thing is that, which is one of the key aspects, is that um, it is probable that the future economic benefit from the asset or service potential in the asset will actually flow to the entity. It is probable that it is probable that future economic benefits or service potential will flow to the entity. will flow to the entity. If we have these two things there, then we can recognize an asset. So the benchmark rule is that a transaction or an item can be recognized as an asset if it meets the definition of an asset. Now, to bring that into perspective, we say that number one, the cost of the asset can be reliably measured, and then number two, it is probable that the future economic benefit, meaning that uh, cash generations and all of those things from the assets will actually flow to the entity or service potential in the asset, meaning that there are certain assets that we cannot directly generate uh, cash flow from, but they can help us in rendering our services. I get it. So for instance, when we buy, say, a printing machine and we are a printing press company and we buy a printing machine, then the output from the printing machine directly serves a purpose for the job for which we are all doing. 
But then if we have computers, the computers will directly not generate revenue from us, but it has what? A service potential in it. So it is probable that significantly the service potential in the asset will actually flow to the entity. That is what we refer to as what? The recognition criteria. So that's the first thing, recognition criteria. Now, after we find out about the recognition criteria and we've met the recognition criteria, we've checked the box, then we need to ask ourselves, what should constitute the initial cost of the asset? So what should constitute the initial cost of an asset? The standard states that, please, I want you to follow me carefully here. I'm going to be dropping some bombs here. So I want you to make sure you follow me and catch the bombs very, very well. Now, the standard states that the initial cost of an asset shall be the purchaser's cost and any other direct cost incurred in bringing the asset to its present use. Let's take that again. The standard states that the initial cost of an asset shall be the purchase's cost and any other direct cost incurred in bringing the asset to its present use. So what does that mean then? It means that the initial cost of the asset includes the following. Number one, the purchase's cost. Or if you want, the purchase's price. That is how much we pay in acquiring the assets. Maybe we bought the asset from China, so some delivery costs will be brought in here, or dispatch costs, if you want to put that in there. Then import duties that we pay on the assets will be brought. Then we bring in the issue of our legal or consultancy fee. Maybe before we bought the asset, we consulted, we spoke with some consultants to be able to help us to actually buy the asset, or in the construction of the asset, we actually had uh, some people, some experts coming in to help us to actually reach a conclusion. So legal or consultancy, consultancy, sorry, fees will also be added. Then uh, installation cost that will also be added there. So the cost we incur in the installation of the asset that will also be added. Not only that, dismantling cost. Usually, dismantling cost goes along with the following environmental cost, EV, EC, sorry, not electoral commission, but environmental cost. So, what this, this one is under IAS uh, 37. So, when we are talking about IAS 37, I'm going to refer you back to this particular statement we are making here, and I want to make sure you get it well. So, this one, so because you see, Dismantling costs or restoration costs or environmental costs, these are future costs. These are costs that we will incur at the end of the economic useful life of the assets. For that reason, IS 37 states that in order for us to incorporate that in the cost of the asset, we need to discount it into present terms. So this dismantling cost and the environmental cost or restoration cost are present value of that future expenditure that we're going to be incurring. Like I said, we will talk about this later on when we are dealing with the issue in relation to IAS 37, and you realize that we will use the entity's current cost of capital or the entity's current borrowing rate in order to discount the cash flows, and then we will add that amount to the initial cost of the asset. Then, borrowing cost. We will be talking about this as well under IAS 23, borrowing cost. We will talk about this under IAS 23, borrowing cost. Now, if the entity borrowed some funds in order to acquire the asset or construct the asset, IAS 23 states that then those uh, costs we incur in the arrangement of the fund and the interest expenses are to be capitalized. So borrowing cost will also be included in the initial cost of the asset. So these are a number of things. So when we say the initial cost of the asset, we say that the initial cost of the asset shall include what? The purchases cost and other direct costs incurred in bringing the asset to its present use. 
other direct costs incurred in bringing the assets to aid presently. So there could be other items, but these are the basic ones. And when we add these up, this gives us the initial cost. Now, this is where it becomes tricky. So I want you to make sure you get me well. There are certain items that we cannot include in the initial cost of the asset. Listen to this carefully. There are certain items, certain transactions that cannot be included in the initial cost of the asset. These are the following. So the standard states that the following costs are not supposed to be included in the determination of the initial cost of an asset. The following. Let's look at them. Number one, feasibility study cost. Feasibility study cost. So what is feasibility study? Probably before in the construction of the assets, the entity did some feasibility study to identify whether really we can build this asset here, whether really it's a good spot to be undertaking, whether really those feasibility study costs, IAS 16 states that it cannot be included in the initial cost of the asset. And IFRI, that is the International Financial Reporting Interpretation Council. Now we will look at the IASB, the structure of the IASB later on, but IFRI is a committee under that provides some interpretation on the standards. So IFRI issued an interpretation about visibility study that it cannot be included in the initial cost of the asset and must be accounted for as a research expenses in accordance with IAS 38. Let me take that again. According to IFRIC interpretation of IAS 16, visibility study cannot be included in the initial cost of the asset. Instead, must be accounted for as a research expenses in accordance with IAS 38. So if we are treating it as a research expenses, According to IAS 38, research expenses are supposed to be what? Written off. For that reason, visibility study cost will not be included in the initial cost of the asset. Instead, will be written off in the year as and when they are incurred. That is the first thing that doesn't come here. Not only that, we have what is called incidental income. This is also not included in the determination of the initial cost of the asset. Now, what, are, what is incidental income? Incidental income are income that arises from incidental operation. Let me take that again. Incidental income are income that arises from incidental operations. What does that mean? Let's say we are constructing the asset. We are constructing a building, right? And we are, we are not done yet. Maybe it's a five-story building. We are not done yet. And so we, were, we are on the third floor. Then some people came and said that, oh, even though you are not done, um, can we store our things here in the meantime so that by the time you are done, we will also get our own store and we'll put it there. So we say, okay, I, the space is just there and we don't use it for anything. So come and put your things there. And we charge them some amount of money and we receive that money. That money we receive is what is referred to as incidental income. Now, the asset is not yet ready for use. Hence, that money we are receiving is actually uh, an incidental income and it's arising as a result of what? Incidental operations. We, we are not intended to rent the building uncompleted like that, but it is just incidental. Someone came up and said, hey, you want to let, uh, rent the building or rent a portion of the building? And we also realized that it's a spot we can make money. So I freak states that Incidental income cannot be included. Usually, you would have deducted it in the total cost of the asset, but cannot be deducted in the total cost in the determination of the initial cost of the asset. Instead, they must be recognized in the income statement of the entity. Are we making sense so far? Let me know in the comment box if you have any questions about something I've said you don't get or something that you don't clearly understand please do well to put it in the chat box for me. I will be very much grateful to hear from you and let me know how it is going and how we are moving so far. So incidental income also cannot be included in the uh, initial cost of an asset. So visibility study 
incidental income, that cannot be included. Then training of employees. Training of staff to use the assets. Got to be very careful here. Training of staff to use the asset that will not have any relationship on the initial cost of the asset. Because the asset is ready for use whether you train them or you don't train them. Hence, the training cost of an asset or of an individual cannot be capitalized. However, listen to this carefully. However, if we are constructing, like the, uh, the statement I made earlier, we are doing a three-story construction and we are employing our staff to be part of the people who are constructing, then the salary we pay to them will be part of the initial cost. Okay? So salary to our construction staff will be part of the initial cost. Inventories we use for the construction will be part of the construction cost. But if the asset is ready for use and we need to train people before they can use the asset, their training is distinguished, is distinct from the asset. Hence, training of employees cannot be included in the initial cost of the asset. But like I said, if we use staff in the construction of the asset, if we use staff in the building of the asset, then the salary we pay to them will be included in the initial cost of the asset. So we can actually include in here the initial cost of the asset, the salary of individuals in that case. Okay, so I see a comment coming in here. I see some of you joining. Welcome to the stream. Do well to give us a thumbs up on the video if you have not given us. Click on the thumbs like button, let it turn to blue if you are making, enjoying and getting value. And then also share the video as well with your friends, your colleagues on your social media or on your WhatsApp platform. Let's get to reach as many students as possible and assist them to be able to understand and prepare well for their examination. So I see some comments coming in here. Let me check them out real quick. Um, Daniel, so if you are watching and you have any questions, put it in the chat box for me. If you have, there are topics, I'm taking topics so that we can design this season very well to be more productive. I see some of you with a like on the video. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So comment in the chat box with any questions you have, topics you would want me to cover on the channel. I want to hear from you guys in that case. Uh, Daniel Kwamil Mensa. Now, if I mention your name wrong, please forgive me, all right? Yeah, this is a great, this is great, but please, it seems you are moving fast, but it is all good, all good. Big ups to my team in Radius Console. Okay, it seems I'm, I'm moving too fast. Okay, okay. Let me know in the comment box. Um, uh, Daniel said, it seems I'm moving too fast. So let me know in the comment box if I'm moving too fast so that I can slow down a little bit, all right? So let me know if I'm moving too fast so I can slow down a little bit, all right? So we can all move at the same pace. Hakim said, but the results are not out for me to know whether I will be writing level three or level two. Yes, the results are not out, but hopefully by Friday it should be out or leaders by Monday. So it should be out in a moment soon. So just keep your fingers crossed. Nicole Williams said, Please do IAS 19. That is employment benefit. Um, so let me add that to our slide. IAS 19. Nicole Williams. All right. MCA. Hello, MCA. Derek Asiyama said, please kindly come again with the explanation of the borrowing cost and dismantling cost. Okay. So this is what I said. Um, the dismantling cost or the restoration cost or the environmental cost is simply a cost that we are going to be incurring at the end of the economic useful life of the assets. It's a cost we are going to be incurring at the end of the economic useful life of the asset. And we account for such costs in accordance with IAS 37 provisions, contingent liability, contingent assets. So how do we do that? What we do is that we would discount, because these are payments to be made in the future, we would discount them into present terms. 
So when we discount them into present term, that present value we get will be included in the determination of the initial cost of the asset. And like I mentioned, we will talk about this uh, very well when we are discussing IS 37, provisions, contingent liability, and contingent assets. Then the borrowing cost is when an entity uh, actually borrows funds to acquire or to build a qualifying asset. A qualifying asset is an asset that takes a substantial time for it to be ready for use or for sale. Okay, for it to be ready for use or for sale. When an entity borrows funds, the cost incurred in the arrangement of the funds and the interest expenses has to be what? Capitalized. And like I mentioned, we will also dive deeper into this when we are talking about IAS 23 um, borrowing costs later on. So uh, that is for Derek and Siama. That is the explanation on the dismantling cost and then the borrowing cost. So let me know in the chat box if the explanation is okay for you. Ernesto uh, said, Ernesto, and next, I'm purple. Then, and next, John Cost and Derek and Siama, this monthly cost of Rubico are to be discounted to their present value. Okay, okay. So I think Ernest uh, Donko was giving reply to uh, Derek uh, for the question that he asked. Thank you, Ernest. That's great. Felix Addo Akwete said, please, can you do something about your timing? As most of us are still working, say 5.30 p.m. Um, Felix, I think, is this the second time you're asking that question? I said, uh, it will not be good for us here to do 5.30 Right, because I have another class at 6 p.m. at most at 6.15 or 6.30. So if we do 5.30, then we will not have enough time to be able to actually uh, do what it is we need to do and cover much. That is why it is uh, 4.30. But if you miss it, no problem. You can always watch the playback. And then if you watch the playback, because the video will be available on YouTube. After the live stream, we are not going to take it off from YouTube. It will still be available on the channel, so you can still watch the playback. And then after watching the playback, if you have any questions, you just leave it in the comment box, and I'm going to come read it, and then I'll give you a reply on it. All right? So, unfortunately, we cannot do 5.30 because of uh, other factors and other things that we do here uh, in that case. Razak uh, Abidemi said, can you explain non-reciprocal transfers in line with uh, IAS 16? Okay, we will look at that. Then, um, Ernest, Ernest Donko said, the Rekensiama, the payment will be made in the future. Okay, hence should be discounted to their present value. All right, so I think Ernest is just giving us, uh, giving Derek the answers um, to the questions that he asked on that case. Okay, so let's see. Gotta see, I have some other comments. In there. So, I think Razak asked a question about um, non-reciprocal transfer in line with IAS uh, 16. Now, when it comes to the, the one way that assets can also be uh, acquired by an entity, so that various ways assets can be acquired by an entity. Number one, by direct acquisition. Number two, by leasing the asset. Number three, by constructing or in-house building the asset. Number four is by exchanging the asset with another company. So uh, non-reciprocal transfer has to do with where we are transferring the asset to another entity and we are not getting anything in return. Neither are we getting cash in return or we are getting any other cash, any uh, asset in return. So under that circumstance, what is going to be happening is that uh, we will account for the asset as though it is a disposal. I think uh, there is a question here that we'll be looking at later on under the standard on how those things are done. But then if we are also going to exchange the asset, that is when there is a reciprocal transfer. So A gives its asset to B, and B gives its assets to A, then we need to, it's also a disposal. 
So we will look at the current value of the asset at the date of the exchange. Then we will look at the value of the asset that we brought. Then we will find out whether the value of the asset we brought is high or low. If the value of the asset we brought is high, then that becomes uh, a gain on the disposal. But if the value of the asset we brought is lower than the current value of the asset we exchange, then that is a loss on disposal. But to your question on non-reciprocal transfers, what is going to be happening is that we're going to treat the transaction as what? Well, a disposal of which no uh, cash was actually received, or was actually had. So in that case, it's going to be a loss on disposal and the asset will be written off in the books of the financial statement. So Razak, Abi, Demi, I think that is the answer to the question. Like I said, there are, other, there are questions specifically on this that we'll be discussing later on as we proceed in the discussion. Any questions, please put them in the chat box for me. Uh, I'll be answering all of your questions for you to assist you to understand what we are doing very well. All right. So what have we done so far? We've looked at the recognition criteria. We've looked at the initial cost of the asset, what constitutes the initial cost of the asset. And we said that the initial cost of the asset shall include the uh, purchases price and any other direct cost incurred in the uh, in bringing the asset to its present use. So we said the purchases cost will come, delivery cost comes, import duties, legal fees, installation cost, dismantling the environmental cost, borrowing cost, and then if it is an internally generated or an asset we are building on our own, then payment to staff will be part of the initial cost of the asset. The inventory we use or cost of inventory will be also part of the initial cost of the assets. I think there is a comment coming from uh, Razak. Also, okay, Razak said, thank you so much. What about its accounting entry? Okay, so if you want the accounting entry in, the, in, regard, in that regard, since, and I think you are asking the accounting entry relating to uh, the non-reciprocal transfer. So in that case, we de-recognize the asset, okay? So uh, we're going to be crediting the PPE account, okay, to de-recognize the asset. And since we are not getting anything re in return, we we'll just debit the income statement uh, to close the account in there, meaning that we're actually making a loss on this disposal. So that is the treatment we do there on that. Then he says, Derek Asiyama said, thanks, sir. You're welcome, Derek. Razak said, also, at what point can we capitalize insurance costs in our asset value? At what point can we capitalize insurance costs in our asset value? Usually, our insurance costs will not be capitalized uh, at, as part of the initial cost of the assets. Unless otherwise, so there are exceptions in here, right, which is the question you are asking. Uh, unless otherwise, uh, the insurance is necessary for the assets to be used. For instance, if you are dealing with probably an oil rig, and by law, it is required that we insure the oil rig, or it is required that we insure the assets, and it is by law, then it means that we need to fulfill that obligation for that reason, we will pay for the insurance on the asset over the economic useful life of the asset. So all the insurance we pay would have to be capitalized and again, amortized every year over the economic useful life of the asset. So usually it is not included in the cost, but if it is required by law or it is necessary to bring the asset to its present use, that is the only thing we can do before the asset can actually be used by law then we can capitalize it under that circumstance. So, Raza, that is uh, the point at which we may capitalize insurance costs. Any other questions, put it in the chat box for me. Any other questions, put it in the chat box for me. So, after the initial recognition, the next thing we look at is what? Subsequent measurement. But before then, we need to look at a double entry. So this initial cost that we have here, the value we're going to be getting here at the end of the day, 
We will be debited to the income statement. Hey, did I say debited to the income statement? Sorry. We'll be debited to the property, plants, and equipment. All right. Then we will credit cash, bank, receipt, and payables. Or provisions. Now, I'm bringing a lot of things to be credited because of the conditions under uh, under view or uh, conditions uh, that we are facing. For definitely, all the total costs will be debited to the uh, asset. All right, but the credit entry will depend on what is happening. So probably we bought the asset on credit. So if we bought the asset on credit, that means we need to credit what? Our payables, creditors, because that amount will be outstanding. Or we paid it in cash, then we need to credit our cash. Or we paid using check, then we need to credit check. Then the issues like provisions, dismantling costs, we must account for them in accordance with what? IAS 37. So in that case, when we debit PPE, what do we credit? We credit the provisions. So that is the initial entry we make for the assets. Okay, I see a couple of things, uh, co comments again coming in. Josie Chamado said, back to IAS 16, did you discuss disclosure? No, please, we've not got to disclosure yet. All right, so NS, NS thank you very much for the engaging replies that you are giving. Now, after the initial recognition, we go to one of the most important aspects of the syllab of the standard, and that is my favorite area, that is called subsequent measurement. Subsequent measurement. So let's look at it. Subsequent measurement. So after the initial recognition, we've debited property plans and equipment and credited what it is that we need to credit. What else do we do? What else do we carry out? So let's look at the subsequent measurement of the assets. Now, when it comes to subsequent measurement of the assets, IAS 16 states that entities can adopt either of the two models below. On subsequent measurements, an entity can carry the asset using the cost module or the revaluation module. So these two modules are available. Now, please stay with me very well here. I'm going to drop another bomb here that I want you to make sure you catch very well. Now, Entities are at their own uh, purview, at their own option, can decide whether they want to use the cost module or the revaluation module. But there is an exception to that. I'm going to give that to you in a moment. But when we say we are carrying the asset at the cost module, what does that mean in practice? Number one, it means that the assets are going to be carried at their historical cost. It means that the assets are going to be carried at their historical cost. Or it means that we need to determine the carrying value of the assets, and that is going to be equal to the cost of the assets minus accumulated depreciation. I want you to follow me carefully here. The entity can either choose the cost module or the revaluation module. Under the cost module, it means that we are carrying the assets at the historical cost, that is, at the initial cost at which we recognize the asset. So if the initial cost was 50,000, that means that we will carry the asset at what? 50,000. That is the historical cost. Or if it is possible for us to depreciate the asset, then we will carry the asset at its current value. And the current value or the current amount of the asset is the cost of the asset, which is the initially recognized cost minus the accumulated depreciation. Then look at the flip side. The second one the entity can also use is the revaluation model. Revaluation model. Under the revaluation model, the entity will be 
carrying the asset at its fair value. The entity will be carrying the asset at its fair value. Remember I told you I'll be dropping a bomb here and it's coming in a moment and I'll notify you when it is a bomb so you get it well. So it means that the asset is being carried at fair value. Now, when we say fair value, what is fair value? So let's get the principles well in that case. Fair value simply refers to, can be defined as the value at which an asset can be sold or a liability settled within knowledgeable parties in an arm length, in an arm's length transaction. The value at which an asset can be sold or a liability settled within knowledgeable parties in an arm's length transaction. That is fair value. So when we say fair value of an asset, it is the value at which an asset can be what? Sold. So fair value. So the, under the revaluation module, it means that assets are being carried at the hour of fair value. What it then means is that the assets carrying amount or carrying value will be equal to the fair value minus accumulated depreciation or impairment. Fair value minus accumulated depreciation or impairment. So two modules are available. The entity can decide to choose the cost module, meaning the assets are being carried at their historical cost, or the entity can decide to use the revaluation module, meaning that the assets are carried at their fair value. If the entity is using the cost module, it means that the carrying amount or the carrying value of the asset will be equal to the cost of the asset minus the accumulated uh, depreciation and if, if we are doing the revaluation model then the current value of the asset will be equal to the fair value minus accumulated depreciation or impairment now this is where the bomb comes in so get it when can the entity use which accounting or which module listen to this carefully even though the entity has a choice of using either of the two modules, the standard further states that the entity can only use the revaluation module. In other words, the entity can only carry the asset at fair value when there is what? An active market for that product or for that asset. So there has to be what? An active market. Now, why is this important? This is important because remember the definition back to fair value. We said that fair value is the value at which an asset can be exchanged or a liability settled within knowledgeable parties in an arm's length what, transaction. So if you want to carry an asset at fair value, that asset should have what, an active market, meaning that there is a market available that you can go and sell that asset or you can go and determine the value of that asset. There is a market available where there are a lot of buyers and there are a lot of sellers in the market. It is a market available where everybody knows the price of something. So where there is an active market available for that particular product, for that particular asset, then the entity can carry the asset at the revaluation module. Please note, where there is no active market available for the asset, the entity is prohibited from carrying the asset at the revaluation module. Instead, the entity then must carry the asset at what? The cost module at the historical cost. Are you getting the principle here? Well, please, if you don't understand, let me know in the chat box and I'll take it again. But let me take the bomb again. Number one. The entity can only, even though the entity has these two options, the entity can only use the fair value module or the revaluation module where there is an active market for that particular asset. Now, to determine whether there is an active market for that particular uh, uh, asset, it means there has to be buyers, there has to be sellers, and everybody knows the price of that particular product. In that case, we can say that this asset has an active markets. Then, we said that if the entity 
or if there is no act, then the entity is prohibited from recognizing. The entity is prohibited from recognizing the asset using what? The revaluation module. Instead, must recognize the asset using what? The cost module. Now, why am I saying this? I am saying this because sometimes an entity will develop an asset by its own self. So it is internally generated assets, internally generated software, or internally generated intellectual property. And they build it themselves, they incur costs in it themselves. Then management on subsequent measurements will say that, oh, this thing that we have constructed, this thing that we've built, we feel that the value has risen over the years. Hence, even though we incur a cost of $50,000 to uh, get it, we, now the value is $100,000. Meaning that they want to now carry that asset at what? The fair value. But the question we need to ask management is, management, is there any active market for the thing that we internally generated? If the answer is no, then the management's decision of using the revaluation module to subsequently recognize that transaction cannot be used. Instead, those assets would still be recognized at their historical cost. And if anything, we would test for impairment whether the value has gone down in that case. If the value hasn't depreciated, then we would still carry it at the historical cost. And this is something that you need to understand very well. I see a comment, some comments coming in there. Let me look at them real quick as well. Adams uh, Pabi said, how often will you conduct these sessions? What days of the week and at what time? All right, so usually Mondays to Friday, 4.30 p.m. each day. Monday to Friday, 4.30 p.m. Saturday, Sundays, I will not be live, but I will be premiering a video or lecture videos and that will still be at 4.30. So I will say for live stream like this, where I am teaching live, it will be Monday to Friday, 4.30 p.m. Saturday, Sunday, we'll be premiering some videos and that will still be at 4.30 p.m. So Adams, that is what you have in there. Now, to know what we would discuss for a particular day, we post it on, uh, on my Instagram. Uh, page so you can follow me on Instagram, Ishura Premium, the same name you see on the channel. You can follow me on Instagram, and every morning we will post the day's discussion so you can plan your schedule to join the stream in that case. Then, also, if you forget, you just subscribe to the channel and hit the bell notification icon. That way, when I go live, YouTube will send you the notification so you can see and then join the stream. So, uh, Adams, that is your answer. Eddie Ward, please, this is my first time joining you guys. Please, can I know the timetable for level two lectures online and what time do the class start? Um, Eddie Ward, I guess you are asking or making an inquiry for our online lectures. Uh, please, you can WhatsApp or call 050-114-9296, okay? 0501149296. So you can call or WhatsApp uh, this line, Eddie Walk, for that inquiry, and it will be sent to you so you can join uh, our online courses. Uh, we do we do the lectures, and you can join live uh, via Zoom every time that we have the lectures, and we have the le courses also available online, so you can watch the playback and get access to the full lecture content as well. So you can call on WhatsApp 050 114 9296 050 114 9296. So Eddie Walker, oh sorry, Eddie Walk, you can reach us on that line and the details will be sent to you. Josie Chamado said IS 16.62A says a depreciation method that is based on revenue that is generated by an entity that includes the use of an asset is not appropriate. What does this mean? Okay, let me take that language again. I think I'm not yet at depreciation though, but if I get to depreciation, I'll talk about this. But let me take that language again. IAS 16.62A says, a depreciation method that is based on revenue that is generated by an, by an activity that includes the use of an asset 
is not appropriate. What does this mean? This is what it means. You know, we have methods of depreciation, and I'll be getting into that. But we have methods of depreciation. We have the straight line method, the reducing balance method, the sum of year decades method, and all of that. What the standard is saying is that if the entity is depreciating the assets because of the revenue generation, so the entity will say, oh, we expect that uh, throughout the life of the asset, we will generate a revenue of $10 million. So that uh, if this year we generate a revenue of $1 million from the asset, then we will depreciate the assets in that regard. Are you getting the idea? So uh, that is not a good way to really depreciate an asset because revenue generation varies from period to period. Rather, we can use the straight line method, the reducing balance method, or sum of year decades method, and not the revenue generating capacity of the uh, assets. That is what this uh, subsection of the IAS 16 actually means. So, Josie Chamado, I hope that makes sense uh, for you. Derek Siaman said, please, under cost model, impairment is not need to determine carrying uh, value. I, I just mentioned that, that uh, sometimes we can test for impairment of the asset, especially if it is a uh, internally generated asset or we built the asset or constructed the asset and it's a specialized asset on its own, usually impairment will uh, come to town in that case. So we can actually uh, talk about the impairment in that case. Eddie Walk said, thank you, Ishura. You are welcome, Eddie. Josie Chamado said, oh, okay, yes, thank you lots. All right. Josie Chamado, that's great. Right, so that is what you need to understand about subsequent measurement. We can either use the cost module or the revaluation module. Please note the circumstances under each of these the circumstances and, uh, under which each of these can be used. Now, even though the standard says an entity can either use the cost module or the revaluation module, the standard also states that at least once a year, an entity must revalue its assets. In other words, assets should always be carried as they are recoverable. An asset should always be carried at most at their recoverable amount. So. At least every year, entities must well, revalue the asset. It is this language that management sometimes uh, follow so that even assets that don't have active market, they will still be trying to what, place a value on it. But the asset must have an active market before we can what, use the revaluation model. Where the asset has no active market, then we don't have any excuse than to carry it at the historical cost model. Any questions for me, please? Any questions for me, please? Now, any questions for me? I'm going to be concluding here today on, on, the, on the discussion today here. And tomorrow, 4.30 p.m., same time, we're going to build up exactly from here. So tomorrow, we're going to be building up exactly from here to talk about depreciation, uh, the methods of depreciation, uh, dealing with the revaluation of assets, then we will solve some questions tomorrow, God willing. So uh, I'll be concluding around here today. Any questions for me? Any questions for me? If you have any questions, let me know in the chat box real quick as we sign off uh, for the day and conclude on our discussion for today. Nana Atrem, hi Ishira. Oh, I miss everything. We'll watch it later. Yes, Nana Atrem, you can watch the playback always later on. You can watch the playback always later on. So tomorrow we're gonna to be build up, building it up from here. We're gonna just start with the depreciation. We will look at the methods of depreciation. So 4:30 p.m. tomorrow, the details will be posted on the or on my Instagram account, and you can follow me on Instagram at Ishira Premium or like my Facebook page at Ishira Premium, and details will be available there as well on that in that note. Now, so I'm going to conclude here today. Thank you very much for joining the stream. It's always a pleasure coming your way. For those of you who did, who give me a thumbs up on the video, I really appreciate it. It helps us a lot. That is what helps the channel to grow. That is what helps us to be able to reach as many students as possible. We want to grow this channel to become uh, an online hub where students across the country, students across the continent,
students across the globe doing accountancy can come on this channel and they'll get content on various subjects, on various topics to assist them to prepare for the examination, pass the examination and ultimately take their life to the next level. So it's always a pleasure for me coming your way and thank you very much for the thumbs up. Thank you very much for the comments. Thank you very much for the subscribing and thank you very much for those of you who are sharing the videos and it's always, always something that I cherish very much as we uh, do this for you guys. Josie Chamado, disclosure tomorrow then. Yes, Josie Chamado, we will talk about disclosure tomorrow. So tomorrow we will talk about depreciation, revaluation, and then uh, disclosure. Then we will solve some questions and that will conclude us on IAS 16. And as Don said, thank you, sir. And it's, it's a pleasure always. And thank you very much for your engagement today on the on the on the chat box for me. Uh, George Amofa said, today is my first time joining and I'm very excited. That is very interesting to hear, George Amofa. Thank you very much for joining the stream. So continue to uh, support the channel, continue to stay connected. Same time tomorrow, 4.30 p.m., I'm gonna come your way. And thank you very much, everyone who commented. Thank you very much, everyone who gave us a thumbs up on the video. And for any inquiries, you can reach us, call or WhatsApp, 050-114-9296, 050-114-9296. We have started lectures for the November 2019, 2020 examination and lectures are ongoing. You can join the lectures via Zoom from the comfort of your home and you join the lectures, be able to learn under my mentorship. And the courses are also available on our study portal that you can uh, get access to and study at your own pace. Most importantly, you are studying under my mentorship so you can prepare well for the examination. So if it is something you are interested in and you are looking for, you can also uh, reach us on 050-114-9296. Details will be sent to you and you'll be able to join our WhatsApp platform as my student learning under my mentorship and join our Zoom sessions, have a one-on-one -on -one session with me for Q&A and also be able to prepare well for the examination. Thank you very much, and I'll see you same time tomorrow. Adam Spawi said, thank you very much, I appreciate. Nicole Williams said, excellent work. Thank you very much, Nicole. So, thank you very much, take care of yourself, and I'll see you same time tomorrow, 4.30 p.m., as we continue with IAS 16. And remember, as far as you are doing the ICA and you're in Ghana, make sure you get a question bank, like I said, it's 40 Ghana cities or whatever, 50 Ghana cities or whatever it is. But make sure you get this book because most of the questions that I'll be solving on the live stream will be coming from this book. So I would want you to get them so that you will not be jumping up in Shirasena as the question, in Shirasena the, the question. So you'll be able to have this book by yourself and use it for your uh, studies as well. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your support. Really appreciate the commitment that you, you take to join us all the time. And I'll see you same time tomorrow. Until then, you take care of yourself and you stay blessed. Bye-bye.